Welcome to Knowledgeable Aging. I'm your host, Jason Kotar. Joining us today to talk about downsizing, how to decide what to take to your new home is Susan Kusek. Susan is a certified professional organizer. For over 25 years, she's helped clients sort through their possessions, encouraging them to keep only what they need or love. She's going to share with us ideas on how to figure out what you'll have space for when you downsize to a smaller home, and some suggestions for how to find new homes for what you're not taking. How are you doing today, Susan? I'm great. How are you, Jason? Very good. Thank you. I'm looking forward to our conversation. Before we get started, a little bit of housekeeping. For those joining us today for the live webinar, if you have any questions, type those questions in. Time permitting, we will do everything in our power to get your questions answered. Also, uh, for those that are joining us today, in the toolbar, you will see three handouts provided by Susan. Please note that these are not property of knowledgeable aging. So if you have any questions or you're unable to download these, please reach out to Susan. She'll give her contact information at the end of the webinar. All right, Susan, I'm going to turn it over to you. Downsizing, how to decide what to take to your new home. Okay, thanks, Jason. I'm in the same age group as many of you and starting the downsizing process myself. As a professional organizer, it's easier for me, but I know how difficult it is for so many people because I've worked with many clients who have a hard time letting go of things. And what we're going to cover today is some tips and techniques for getting ready for your process. So first, I'm going to talk about some reasons for downsizing, then the realities of downsizing, because most people don't realize how long it takes. Then how to decide what to take, some resources for donating and selling, and some additional resources. Now, the main reasons why we want to downsize is most of us want to move to one level living. I'm in the Washington, D.C. area, and most of the places are like mine, are townhouses or multiple level homes. And as we get older, the steps get harder and harder. We also want less outside maintenance. We're tired of mowing the lawn and taking care of all of that stuff. We also want less space to take care of inside and less stuff to take care of. You might have been in your home, your current home, for 20 or 30 years or longer, and you've accumulated a lot of stuff, and it's a lot to take care of, and less to pack and move. One of my clients, not a senior, a couple of years ago, they bought a house out of town. They wanted to move in the summer while their college-age kids were home, and he told his wife, we don't have time to declutter. Let's just move everything, and we'll do it then. Well, then he got an estimate from the moving company and changed his mind because it's expensive to move a lot of the stuff that you don't really need. And there's a bonus too. Uncluttered homes sell faster for more money. Now the realities of downsizing. Over the last month or so, I talked to some friends who are in the process of downsizing and a client who re recently finished downsizing. And I asked them, what were their feelings about the process? I heard a lot of negative things. One client said it was an ordeal. I heard stressful and exhausting many times. One of my friends said it was one of the hardest things she's ever done. And most people said, I wish I had started sooner. So then I asked them, once it was over, how did you feel? Everybody was so happy. I heard lighter, freer, liberated. It feels so good, unburdened. I feel relieved. A couple of people said, I'm glad I got rid of so much. And a number of people said, I am so glad I did this while I was physically able to do it. Not one person said that they regretted getting rid of as much as they did. And everybody was so happy that they downsized as much as they did. Now, one of the people I talked to was very sentimental, and she kept a lot of cards and letters. And she said she got some advice from a relative who told her, when you're going through your cards and letters and other memorabilia, remember, enjoy, relish, relinquish. And she said this really helped her because as she was going through her cards and letters, she read them and enjoyed them. She relished them and she relinquished most of them and just kept two small boxes of them. 
Now I asked them too, I said, if you had any words of wisdom for somebody who's starting the down, downsizing process, what would you say? One of them said, don't be hurt if your children don't want any of your stuff. A number of years ago, Forbes magazine did an article that was titled, your children don't want your brown furniture. Most of your kids have their own homes and they're probably filled with furniture. They might want one or two things, but don't feel bad if they don't want a lot of your stuff because their taste is probably different from yours and their style is probably different. A lot of people said it takes more time than you think because you've accumulated a lot of stuff over time and when you're getting rid of it, it's not a quick process for most people. So it's recommended too that you pretend you're moving in six months, even if you won't be moving for a couple of years. I always tell people, if you're gonna be moving anytime in the next five years, go ahead and start now because it will take longer than you think. And it's never too soon to start. Some people downsize even if they're not moving because they just wanna make their environment more comfortable and not have as much stuff around or to take care of. A couple of people said, do not move more than will fit. It's harder to dispose of if you move into a senior living community because a lot of the charity pickup organizations tell you you have to have your stuff at the curb. You can't do that if you're in a senior living facility. And another suggestion for furniture, start with a list of what you're going to take, not what you're going to get rid of, but what you're going to take, making sure you have enough space for each item. So how do you decide what to take? Please, please, please do not take all of those just in case items. You won't have room for them. A friend helps me with repairs around the house. And when I wanted to organize my unfinished basement, get rid of a lot of the nuts and bolts and nails that we had accumulated over the years, he didn't want to. But it turns out whenever we're working on something, we never have the right size and we go to Home Depot anyway. So get rid of all those just in case things because you can always buy something if you need it. So how do you decide? You wanna take what you're gonna use and what you're going to use may be different from what you've been using in the past. A lot of times we have hobbies that we used to love doing, but we can't physically do them anymore. And it's hard to give up that, but there's somebody who probably would enjoy having your wood carving materials or, or your skis, maybe a relative or even donating them, somebody will make good use of them. Also, you want to take just what you love. Now, you may say that you love everything that you have, but you have to be selective because you know that you're not going to have room for everything. So you want to pick out the things that you love the most. And you've probably gotten a number of gifts over the years. When somebody gives you a gift, it's yours. You should not feel that you have to keep it forever because your tastes change and you don't have room for everything that you love. So you have to be selective. But the most important thing in deciding what to take is what will fit in your new space. And I'm going to talk about how you can figure that out. So how do you know what will fit? One of the things you can do is you can do a floor plan of your new space. And the other thing is a list of rooms in your current space compared to the new space. Guessing what will fit does not work. So floor plans. Now, you may not know where you're moving. I don't know where I'm moving, but I know that I want to move to a place that's only about a thousand square feet. So I looked online for floor plans to, to get dimensions of rooms. So I'd have an idea of what I would have to work with. Your floor plan, your floor plan does not have to be fancy. This is one I did for a client who had a master bedroom that was about four times the size of the house he was having built. And he wanted to have a recliner in his bedroom on an angle facing the TV. And I told him that I said it would be really, really tight because generally you want three feet in between furniture to move. And also you might want to stop and think about if you need room in the future, maybe for a wheelchair. So I did a floor plan and I used graph paper that has one square to, an, to a foot so that you can easily see if there's three feet to move and how much space there is. And then I draw the furniture, I measure the furniture and I draw it on the same graph paper on another sheet and I cut it out. I usually outline it in blue or black so it stands out. And I use a glue stick to attach it so it's easy to move around. 
And when you put it on the floor plan, then you can get a visual idea. Now, if you know where you're moving and you have the actual floor plan, note the windows, the floor vents, wall vents, electrical, cable, and phone. Keep in mind the depth of the baseboard. In my living room, the floor vents for heating and air conditioning. There's one in the middle of each of two floors. It's near the wall, but that means I can't put a big piece of furniture on that wall. So once you know where you're going, take that into consideration too. But I find that doing the floor plan helps people who are visual. The other option is to list the rooms in your current home and in your future home. So here's an example of mine. I have a, I call it a tiny townhouse. It's 1800 square feet, which includes the unfinished basement. So I listed the rooms I have. I put in the dimensions. Then from one of the floor plans I found online of a place that would be similar to what I'm moving to, I listed the rooms and the dimensions. And then I highlighted in yellow the rooms that I have that I will not have in the new place. One of the areas that I looked at on this um, list, the dining area that I have now, it's a country kitchen with a kitchen and a dining area. And where I would move, there would be a combination living room dining area. That combination living room dining area is about the same size as my current living room. So it's like, okay, I probably am not taking my dining room table. I have an office that's got a desk, a table, four two drawer file cabinets, I would have to get rid of all of that because I would not have a place for it. A friend of mine who recently downsized, let me share her list. They went from a place that was about 6,000 square feet to about 4,000 and they had a lot fewer rooms. Actually, when they looked at this, they opted to have um, a loft built in their new place that they were having built where they put an exercise room and an office. So this helps a lot because you can actually see with the space, you have to get rid of a lot of furniture if you're moving to a smaller size. And one of the things that helps is if you figure out the square foot percentage of your new home compared to your current home. In my case, my new home would probably be 60% of my current home. So I have to get rid of at least 40% of my stuff. One of my friends recently downsized from an 8,000 square foot house to a 2,500 square foot house. She said she is getting rid of two thirds of her stuff. And she's a retired researcher. She's done a great job. She's been able to sell some things and consign some things, but it takes time. She said it's a full-time job. So the sooner you can start, the better off you are. Also, when you're moving, think about the size of your kitchen cabinets and closets in your current home and what you're gonna have in the new one. Chances are you're going to have fewer kitchen cabinets and fewer shelves and smaller closets or less of them. And what some people suggest is to put blue painter's tape on the floor in front of your current closets and kitchen cabinets for the linear feet you'll have in your new space. Then you can take a look at what you have and say, oh, I've got to get rid of these things. And you might even want to start getting rid of them now and keeping what you have in space that's similar to your new space. You can also use blue painter's tape to mark the space, say, in your living room. If your living room like mine is 15 by 15 and my new living room is going to be half the size of that, I could put painter's tape down and then move my furniture around and see what would fit. You also want to think about how much wall space you have to hang artwork. One of my clients moved to Florida and she had a lot of windows. So she had very little space to hang artwork. And that helped her decide what to get rid of before she moved everything down to Florida. In your new space, you may not have a basement or an attic where you can store things or a garage. So think about all of that and get rid of as much as you can before you move because it's a lot harder to get rid of it once you've moved. Now, you can make it easier on yourself if you get on-site help. You might have a family member who will help you or a friend or you could hire a professional organizer like myself. You could also have an accountability partner, maybe a friend even out of town. I've been working with a friend who used to be a client on accountability and we talk once or twice a week. We set a date and time, usually at 10 a.m. 
and we'll talk on the phone for five minutes and say what we're going to work on. She's working on continuing to organize her office that I've been helping her with. And I'm working on a book that I'm writing about organizing papers. So we'll talk at 10 and then check in again at 2 p.m. to say how we did. And this helps a lot of people. If you have on-site help or an accountability partner, schedule a specific time with that person. The advantages of having an accountability partner or somebody to help you in person as it keeps you focused. Also, in-person help helps you with the heavy lifting. And that can provide a disinterested point of view. Somebody may be a family or friend or professional organizer can say, well, how often do you use that? Is that something that you really love? And that might help you. Now, when you're starting to downsize, what you want to do is gather your supplies and then make space for separate things that you're going to be getting rid of. I like using the large black trash bags, the 1.2 mil, because they're sturdy enough, 33 gallon, for things that are for trash. I never use black bags for anything else, only for trash, because you don't want it mistaken for something that you want to keep. Then for fabric items or soft things to donate a gift to others, I use the white kitchen trash bags or clear plastic bags. Boxes are a big help. You can get moving boxes, Bankers boxes, which is a brand name, or economy storage boxes, they're the ones with the lids and they have handles, so it's easy to stack them up when they're not in use. You would have one for items to donate, another for items to give to others, what you're going to try to sell, one for recycling, one for shredding, one for hazardous waste, and label each with a Sharpie. And I always recommend having a notebook. Make a list of the items you're donating just in case you have enough to itemize on your tax return. List the furniture you plan to take to your new home and list items you're giving to others and who you're giving them to. I talked to my brother the other day in Australia and they've been downsizing even though they're not moving. And he said that he had the, they had the two daughters go around and say what they would want when their parents were ready to give it up. And um, he made a list and I suggested he have them sign it because I've seen too many cases where even though they love each other, when people die, sometimes their heirs get into arguments about who gets what. So talk to your kids when you know that you're going to be moving and say, you know, for the stuff that we don't want, which of these things would you like to have? Then when you're downsizing, you might need to clear out a room or some corners to make spaces for these. But Designate a space where you're going to put things to donate. If you're going to have one of the charities come and pick up things, if you have a two-car garage and you can make space in one of the bays, you can put everything there that's going to be for pickup, and then you can call somebody, call well in advance, and have them pick it up. The same if you have a lot of stuff to be hauled away, things that are broken. Um, designate space outside in the garage if you can. Designate a space for things you're going to give to family members or friends. If you're going to try to sell things or consign them, designate a space for that. Now, it'd be too hard to put the furniture that you're giving away or hope to sell in that space. But again, add that to your list of items that you want to sell or consign. If you have weekly pickup for recycling, take full advantage of that. When I worked with a client, his recycling company did take hardcover books, which is rare. He had all sorts of old hardcover books, and we, we had that big recycle bin filled up every week. Take the trash out at the end of the day and make full use again of your trash pickup. You might have to have a trash pickup towards the end if you have a lot. I like using the banker's boxes or the shredding boxes for shred, and I'll hold on to them. I took four a couple of weeks ago to one of the community shreds, and they will just empty your boxes and give you the box back so you can reuse them. Then keep hazardous waste separate because you cannot put that in the trash or recycle it. You might have to take it to your locality's hazardous waste removal. And again, once you know what you won't keep, ask your children or other family members or friends if they want any items. So how do you get rid of all that stuff? One option is to donate. Another one is to sell, but it's fairly hard to sell things. Another option is to give stuff away. And you can pay to have it taken away. So one of the three handouts that Jason mentioned that's available 
is a list of donation places and some information on hazardous waste and junk hauling companies. I'm in the Washington DC area, Northern Virginia. So a lot of the drop off places are local to me, but many of them have national localities. And then I have some that are national pickups. So for the local donation places, especially now with COVID, call first to make sure they're taking donations. Goodwill in my area changes their donation times occasionally. So make sure that you know what time you can take things there. Don't wait until the end of the year because people who can itemize their taxes will be doing whatever donations they can. And the donation places sometimes get filled up, especially towards the end of the year. So when you're working on donating things, if they're smaller things, put them in your car right away and drop off the donations often so that it's not a major task when you want to get rid of everything. Now for charities that pick up, most require items to be at the curb or in a garage, an open garage or a carport. They do not go in the house because of insurance reasons. Make sure you put a sign with the charity's name. One of my clients had set out a whole bunch of dishes. She called one of the charity donations. They didn't pick it up because there was no sign and they didn't know for sure that it was meant for them. For Salvation Army, last time I looked, you had a schedule a couple of weeks in advance. Goodwill in the Washington DC area no longer offers free pickup. They refer you to college hunks hauling junk with a fee and you get a discount if you're doing it for Goodwill. There are many other organizations that do pick up for free. Again, don't leave it till the last minute because you need lead time. Now selling. I'm not good at selling, so I don't plan on selling any of my stuff. But if anybody wants to sell it for me, I would take them up on that. It's a lot of work. The clients and the friends who I've talked to who have sold stuff, they say that the best luck they've had is on Facebook Marketplace, Nextdoor, and Craigslist to a certain extent. You have to be a little more careful on Craigslist, I think, whereas on Nextdoor and Facebook Marketplace, the people have to give their real names and you can private message them so you don't have to give out your address except for somebody who's coming to pick up something from you. Don't expect to get the money that you want. Um, one person I know had a, a huge house, beautiful rug and the foyer. Their foyer was probably about the size of my living room. I don't know what they paid for it, but she was asking $1,250 and she got $360. And she was happy for that because she knows you can't get what you paid for it. So one option is to sell it yourself, but then you have to take the photographs, the listing, then deal with the people one-on-one. -on -one. You could also see about hiring an estate sale company. The friend with the large house was able to consign some things with an auction house. She had a lot of high-end furniture. You can also try consigning some of the smaller things with the consignment store that's a brick and mortar store or online. Now a disclaimer, the listing that I have of the places is not an endorsement. I have not used most of these, although one of my clients used Max Sold and other organizers have and everybody's been happy with it. That's what I would use, I think, when I'm downsizing. But do your research, check reviews and references. There's a couple of specialty places that are members of my Chap of my organizers chapter that I've got listed here too. Now, besides those two handouts that are um, available, if you're, if you're not able to download them on the webinar, you can email me and I'll send them to you. There's a couple of books you might find helpful too. I've read all three of these books in the last couple of weeks and really like them. One is The Boomer Burden, Dealing with Your Parents' Lifetime Accumulation of Stuff. And this helps whether it's your parents that you're working with or for yourself. Now, it was written in 2007, but it's still true today, even though it doesn't address digital issues like passwords. The second book was written by a fellow certified professional organizer who's also a senior move manager, Vicki Delakia. Her book is titled, Don't Toss My Memories in the Trash, a step-by-step -step guide to helping seniors downsize, organize, and move. And it's got a lot of great advice in it. The third one was also published in 2007 by C.G. Weir, Right Sizing Your Life, Simplifying Your Surroundings While Keeping What Matters Most. It's a good how-to 
I don't agree though with some of her suggestions about keeping papers, about record retention, but the rest of it I thought was really good. And then I came across an article that was from mymove.com. It's mymove.com slash moving slash guides slash senior hyphen guide hyphen downsizing. And it had a lot of good tips in it. So take some time and do some reading if you're putting off the downsizing. If you're sentimental and you want to keep everything, I think that these resources will help you. Now, if you want help from a professional, I'm not working on site with clients, although I'm working virtually, but I belong to NAPO, the National Association of Professional of Productivity and Organizing Professionals. You can go to our website, napo, N-A-P-O dot net, put in your zip code and select the distance and search for an organizer who works with downsizing, who's a move manager, works with seniors, etc. cetera. NAPO has 29 chapters. So on the napo.net website, you can click on about and see a list of chapters that might be in your area and you could look for an organizer there as well. My Washington DC chapter is dcorganizers.org and you can click find a pro. There's also the National Association of Senior Move Managers. Many of the members of that are also members of NAPO. Their website is NASM, N-A-S-M-M dot org, and you can click find a senior move manager. Now, if you're moving to a senior living facility, many of those have a recommended company that's familiar with their facility who will help you with your downsizing and move. So you might want to check into that. Now, if you need additional professional help, maybe you're helping somebody who has hoarding disorder or chronic disorganization or ADHD, which is attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. It's harder for those people to let go of things and to figure out how to, how to downsize and how to get their move organized. So here are some resources. One is the Institute for Challenging Disorganization. Their website is challengingdisorganization.org. You can enter your zip code and search for a professional near you. Many of their members work with people who have hoarding disorder or chronic disorganization and other uh, brain injuries, things like that. They also have a clutter hoarding scale that you can take a look at. And many of the members of ICD are also members of NAPO, the professional organizers in most cases. If you go to the NAPO site, you can search under residential specialties for hoarding if you're looking for somebody to help with that. A great book was written by three doctors in the field of hoarding, Dr. David Tolan, Randy Frost, and Gail Skeketi. It's called Buried in Treasures, Help for Compulsive Acquiring Savings and Hoarding. They've spoken at a number of conferences I've attended and they are, they are wonderful. Then there are virtual clutter groups guided by the book Buried in Treasures. They're run by Kathleen Crombie. I do not know her, I have not attended any of them, but a number of the other organizers had um, suggested her. And her website is in order to hyphen organize.com. And one of the handouts that you have available is the, the PowerPoint slide. So this information will be there. What's realistic if you are looking to downsize regarding time frame? The it, it all depends on how quickly you make decisions. I found with working with clients one on one over the years, some people make decisions quickly. Other people, it takes them a long time to make decisions. So it depends on the individual. It would, if need be, somebody could downsize in, in a month or two, but they would have to be ruthless and they would have to be really, you know, be a full-time thing. I recommend, you know, at least six months. And I'm starting, I don't know when I'm not going to be able to do the steps in my townhouse anymore, but I want to be ready to move when that happens. And so I'm starting the downsizing process now. It might not be five years before I move. But what I would do is, you know, take a look at yourself and how, how quickly do you make decisions? You might want to start with downsizing one room and time, how long it takes. And then that would give you a better idea of how long the rest of the house would take. And let me mention that papers take a lot longer than anything else. I hope that helps. It does. Very good. Um, so if somebody decides to work with one of the professionals that you had listed there, um, is the expectation that they're going to work with them to 
sell their current residence or would they potentially be working with them as they look for a new home to downsize to? They, well, with the professional organizers, they would help you with the downsizing rather than looking for a new home to move to. They can help you with um, making the decisions about getting rid of stuff. They can help you with where to donate. Uh, most of them do not do selling. That's not a skill that everybody has or enjoys. And there are organizations that help you find a place. Um, I think one is called A Place for Mom. Another one is Caring.com that you can talk to about finding a place to move to. But the professional organizer would not have the knowledge and experience for that. Okay. Last question. I know this is a, a broad-based question, but do you have an idea they asked approximately how much it is to hire one of these professionals to help with this process. Okay, well, professional organizers, each person sets their own rate. And the range is generally, it depends on what area you're in too, but in the Washington DC area, the range is generally um, $50 to $120 an hour. And what people charge is usually based on their experience. And the, um, the number of hours that it takes, it varies. I, I had two jobs that were huge, huge downsizing jobs because the people had a lot of stuff and it was hard for them to let go of things in one case. and the other case, it was a couple who both worked full time and they didn't have time to work with me. Um, so I had to set, out, set aside the stuff I thought they could get rid of based on what their parameters were and then go over it with them later. So that took longer too. With other people, it's a fairly fast process because they have not accumulated as much and they're not sentimental. So what you, when you work with a professional organizer, most of them have a situation where you don't have to, to commit to you know, so many hours. When I work with people on site, I have a four hour minimum for each work session and people can work on their own in between if they want. I will give them quote homework and they can stop at any time and continue on their own. So there's no commitment to, to spending a massive amount of money. You can just maybe hire somebody to get a jump start to work for you know, one or two sessions and then continue on your own on their own, or you could continue to have them work with you. Very good. Well, Susan, how can people find you? Okay, if anyone wants to contact me, the last slide is some information about uh, what I do. And I'm not working on site, as I mentioned, but I am working virtually. And I can help people create a home inventory, get set up in Quicken, organize digital files and email messages, and create your vital documents and input the critical information that's needed if something happens to you. If you'd like to email me, my email address is susan, S-U-S-A-N, at balancedspaces.com. That's B-A-L-A-N-C-E-D-S-P-A-C-E-S.com. And my phone number is 571-752-6355. And if you'd like to be on my email list for organizing tips, just send me an email. And if you have trouble downloading the, the three handouts, which includes this PowerPoint, just send me an email. Again, susan at balancedspaces.com. Excellent, Susan. As far as knowledgeable aging, uh, thank you for those joining us for the live webinar. We our aim is to have two to three live webinars each week. Uh, if you have the time, check out our uh, YouTube page. Type in Knowledgeable Aging, uh, subscribe. We update the YouTube page four to five times per week with the full webinars, also with some clips. If you are a podcast listener, check us out on Spotify, iTunes, etc. Till next time, I'm your host, Jason Kotar, and this is Knowledgeable Aging. <laughs>